Right. Good morning, everybody. Good, good morning, everybody. So we are on now to our next session of the Bible and Evolution. This is session six. We are looking at a flood. And we are continuing um, this concept of the gap theory, which is what some people also call the ruin construction theory. And this theory upholds a belief in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that's, that God's initial creation was perfect. If you turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, okay, you see that uh, people believe uh, God's initial creation was perfect. Everything was very good and sin had not existed. However, this gap theory assumes, so that, that you go again, it's not what the Bible says, but it's what people believe, okay? They believe that there is a great catastrophe that occurred that caused the earth to be thrown into a chaotic state by verse 2. Because they see that verse 2 says, now the earth was formless and empty. Okay? Formless and empty. So they take that as uh, something happened between these first two verses of Genesis to cause the earth to become formless and void which they interpret as desolate and uninhabitable. Nobody can live, nobody lived and nobody can live. But that was after it had been made perfect. And those who embrace the gap theory believe that this state of ruin could have possibly lasted millions or some people believe it's billions of years. So if you look at this picture here, Right In the beginning, on the left-hand side, in the beginning, God created the heavens, the S is missing, and the earth. That's the very first verse. And then uh, people believe there's a gap here. That's why it's called gap theory of billions of years where a great catastrophe occurred. Because in verse 2, they say, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So this is some people's interpretation. And many people place a gap of indeterminate, indeterminate time between Genesis 1.1 and 1.2. And there are variations on what supposedly happened in this time gap. And the most popular in such millions uh, or like I said, or some people believe it can be billions of years of geologic time, including billions of fossil animals, those who died between the two verses. And this is why it's called the ruin reconstruction version of the gap theory. After they died in verse two, got recreated all over again. Now, this gap theory presupposes death bloodshed, disease, and suffering occurred before Adam's sin in chapter 3. And supporters of this theory therefore accept the theories of scientists to reinterpret God's word for their purposes, to fit in the idea that there can therefore now be evolution. Oh. Ah, okay, but this undermines the gospel because uh, if death, or bloodshed, and disease occurred before Adam's sin, then sin did not, uh, death did not come in because of human sin. It, it came in because of something else. And this is where some also put Satan's fall, Satan's rebellion in this presumed period. But again, putting Satan's rebellion at this time gap contradicts God's conclusion that his completed creation on day six was very good okay so both both ways there would be a contradiction of the bible so the gap theory introduces beliefs that contradict the truth of scripture and opens the door for compromise to say in verse one in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth 
And then there was chaos and destruction. That's the gap theory. And then verse 2, that's why the earth was formless and empty. Because whatever God created was destroyed by uh, the rebellion. Okay? And this is not correct. It contradicts the teaching that sin and death entered the world through Adam. Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. Okay, there you go. The Bible tells us that death came in because of sin. And it's through one man. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Okay, and you can also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 and 22. If somebody is fast, can you please quickly turn there and read for us? Because today there are a lot of slides to go through. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. I read no? First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21. No? For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes only through a man. 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Thank you, Meg. Okay, so death came through one man, and resurrection will also come through a man. Okay, so the Bible tells us very clearly sin and death entered because of the man. Okay, so to have this gap theory to say that death and all the destruction, everything happened earlier contradicts the Bible. So we see the gap theory is not biblically consistent or correct. And furthermore, when you look at Revelation 21 verse 1, John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. So he says there is a, he saw a new heaven and a new earth. So if there was creation and then destruction between Genesis 1 and 1 verse 1 and 1 verse 2, then the original creation should have been the first heaven and first earth and this that John saw should have been the second. Uh, and this gap theory therefore contradicts Revelation 21 verse 1. If the gap theory was true, the new heaven and the new earth should be uh, second, not the first. Okay? And then, of course, Genesis 1 31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Yeah? If there was a gap where death and destruction occurred, how could God say all that he had made was very good? Yeah, doesn't make sense. So all the Bible verses that we see tell us that there could not have been a gap between verses 1 and 2. So let's, let's take a look now at uh, something that can close the gap. Okay? Okay. Uh, Something that can close the gap. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay? Oh, and verse 2 says, And darkness was on the face of the, the deep. Deep meaning the water. So face of the deep means face of the waters. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. Uh, so we show, we see that the Spirit of God was the energizer. He, is, he was the one that started creating life from there. Okay? Life where it started with the water. Life came from first the water. Okay, so we close the gap theory uh, and see how it would have been uh, without a gap. Okay, and we also try to take account um, Satan's rebellion. 
So the first thing that happened was God created the heavens and the earth, right? Um, and the heavens with the plural S means the three heavens that we know. First one is the atmosphere of planet Earth. That's the first heaven. Second one is outer space. And then the third one is where God's throne is. The Bible tells us that Paul was in the third heaven. Okay, so the third heaven was where God's throne is. So God created the heavens and the earth. So that is the physical as well as the spiritual, where his throne is. Now, at creation, earth was without form and void because it was covered with water. Yeah, uh, because you, you don't really see the land at that point. The earth was covered with water until God separated the land and the seas on the third day. That's in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Okay, so it was without form and void because basically water covered the whole earth. Yeah, and in that sense, it could not possibly, you could not possibly see land and mountains and all that at that point in time. Then you have the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters which we know science uh, has this idea of primordial soup and the waters fit the equivalent of that primordial soup. Only uh, the primordial soup did not produce life as we saw from the Miller and Urey experiment, right? They failed to prove that life came from the primordial soup. Life came from the Holy Spirit instead, okay? So God through the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters, began to create. And the Bible uses quite a special word uh, in the Hebrew, the Holy Spirit hovering. Okay, it's like a, the picture is like a mother hen, all right, with, uh, with its wings over the place and like getting ready to hatch an egg, getting ready to produce. Not that he is an egg, eh? the Holy Spirit is not an egg. But the concept is like a mother hen about to produce an egg. So that kind of hovering over the waters. So the Holy Spirit created and on first day, after the heavens and the earth and the water all over, right? Uh, God also created light. And then the second day and so on. And the third day was where God separated the land and the waters, the seas. And on sixth day, God finished creating and saw that everything he created was very good. So there you go. You have all the six days of creation. There's no gap there. All right. The, uh, what people think is the gap is actually waters cover the earth until that day God separated the water and the land, the seas and the land. Now, then come to Satan. How does Satan fit in? Satan was created with the angels. They, although it is not specified, okay, if we really have to make, a, make an intelligent guess, it would be probably, probably, okay, the first day, because that's when God created the heavens and the earth. So you have the heavens, as I said, the earth atmosphere, first heaven, space, second heaven, and the third heaven is the throne of God, which is the spiritual realm. Yeah. So God, if we have to hazard a guess, God would have created Satan probably at the time when he created the spiritual realm together with his third heavens. Okay. And when Satan was created with the angels, he was morning star. Okay, can somebody turn to Isaiah 14? Uh, hold on first till we finish this partner. Just turn to Isaiah 14 for us. Turn, uh, prepare to read verses 12 to 14. Another person turn to Ezekiel 28. Prepare to read for us verses 12 to 15 and 17a, the first part of verse 17. Okay, so, so Satan was created and he was the morning star. He was very bright and beautiful and he was the model of perfection in Eden, Garden of Eden. Blameless 
before he rebelled out of pride. And then from there, he tempted Eve. Okay, so we can close the gap theory uh, where Satan did not rebel uh, the, between verses 1 and 2. But Satan rebelled later, closer to the time that he tempted Eve. Okay, so can somebody now help us to read from uh, Ezekiel 28, verses 12 to 15 and 17, the first part. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and said to him, This is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, keys, and burn. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. Verse 14. You were anointed as a guardian uh, cherub, for so I ordain you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walk among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wicked, wickedness was found in you. Okay, verse Through, 17, uh, the first part. Verse, verse 17, uh, yes. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Max. So that is where we read an account of... Uh, the message is actually supposed to be the king of Tyre, but the description is such that when you read it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit because it talks about verse 13 where you were in Eden, the garden of God. Right? So it's a little bit confusing, but, the, but what Ezekiel is doing here is he's giving a message to the king of Tyre where he makes a comparison a similarity of the king of Tyre's behavior and attitude, the pride, okay? He was the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. As a man, he was somebody very impressive. So much so that he behaved just like Satan in Eden. Okay, so this is where uh, Ezekiel makes a a comparison or a similarity between the king of Tyre's pride and rebellion against God, similar to Satan. And so part of the message to the king uh, actually was describing Satan's pride and rebellion. Okay, so that's where the, the verse 13 comes in with, you were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone adorned you. And that is where, actually, if you recall, the serpent came to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, right? In chapter 3, uh, we are told that the serpent came to speak to Eve and tempt her. Now, the word the serpent in Genesis 3 verse 1 tells us that the serpent was actually a shining one, a shining one. And not surprisingly, down here in verse 13, every precious stone adorned you. Why was the serpent shining? Because it had all these shining stones. It was a very beautiful model of perfection, perfect in beauty. All right, so we have uh, the serpent, uh, the serpent that is Satan, coming to, uh, Eve, to Eve. Okay, uh, because it was part of his rebellion. Now, can somebody look 
at uh, Isaiah chapter 14. Read for us verse 12 to 14. Isaiah 14, 12, 12 to 14, right? Yes, thank you. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once lay down, lay low the national nation, sorry. Verse 13, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the, the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. Verse 14, I will ascend above tops of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. Thank you, Kelvin. Okay, so what we see here is the description of Satan in his rebellion. Okay, so just now when we were looking at Ezekiel, it was describing how beautiful and perfect and wise he was as the angel, all right, that was in the Garden of Eden. But down here in Isaiah 14, again, this is actually uh, not, about, not truly supposed to be about Satan, but it was a prophecy against Babylon. Once again, you have another king, this time not Tyre, this time it's Babylon, where we see the where we see once again the pride, right? The pride and the rebellion of this king of Babylon who set himself up to be in a very high position to be like God. So here in verse 12, Isaiah 14, uh, how you have fallen from heaven. O morning star, son of the dawn. If you look at Luke chapter 10, verse 18, which we are not going to turn to, Luke chapter 10, verse 18, you will find Jesus telling his disciples, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So Satan rebelled and Jesus saw the fall or the casting out of Satan from heaven. Okay, so he has fallen from heaven, the morning star, cast down to the earth. And he said in his heart, I will ascend to heaven. So in his pride, he actually wanted to raise his throne above the stars of God. Yeah, and verse 14, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds and make myself like the most high. He, he rebels against God to the extent that he wants to be at the level of God. That's why when he came to tempt Eve, he said, he said, when you eat the fruit, you will be like God. Because he himself rebelled and wanted to be at the level of God. Okay, so Satan was created before uh, uh, sorry, created was created before the sixth day when everything was very good. After the everything was created very good, he rebelled. And between then and the time that he went to Eve, he rebelled against God. And then he came down to uh, the Garden of Eden to tempt Eve. All right, so that closes the gap theory where there's no contradiction of the Bible verses that we have. Satan rebelled between uh, probably day seven because day seven was a day of rest. After day seven and the time that he went to tempt Eve. How long that was, uh, that time gap, we are not told. Okay, so perhaps he, in his pride, when he saw how God made everything beautiful and man was God's masterpiece, he could, again, speculation, he could have felt jealous. He could have felt like, okay, I also want to be the master of all these beautiful things that God has created. So he elevated himself and then he went to tempt Eve. Okay, so we close the gap for a possible explanation of uh, how Satan fits in and there's no gap theory. So next here, we see this, uh, somebody made this slide of theos theistic evolution. Remember, theistic means God created. After that, God let everything be created in 
uh, through evolution. He made the first part of creation and after that everything he left to evolution to work out. So this cartoon says God made this millions of years ago, one cell animal. This it is now extinct but evolved in some into something better. So it evolved in something better. Now extinct and evolved into something better. All right, this uh, ape-like creature. Now extinct, evolved into something better. All right, and then now extinct, evolved into something even better. And so finally, you have this, this man here and his bubble, thought bubble says, why would I want to believe in a God that had to do so much erasing before he could bring me into the picture? So that shows that there is not, a, uh, the point here is there's no gap theory. There's no evolution taking place. That's the point. Okay, so we close the gap. We close the concept of uh, evolution from what we have explored last week and today. And we look at this uh, cartoon, okay, where this, were the days of creation long geologic periods or 24 hours? That one we answered last week. Was there a gap in the creation between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2? We just saw, answer is no. Okay, so you see, if this person puts it very nicely in a cartoon, if day means millions of years, and then God created could mean God evolved everything. And then Adam means a group of people and very good. Genesis 1.31, God created and everything was very good, includes death and suffering. Then a reader will read Genesis and say, wow, Genesis is so difficult to understand. You see, the point of this cartoon is if you have to do all kinds of gymnastics to make sense of the creation account in Genesis, you are reading it wrong. Okay? If you are to interpret this way, that way, if you do mental gymnastics with the meaning of words, like one day can mean millions of years, and then another day, another time, day is 24 hours, yeah? Then it is inconsistent and confusing to determine when a day is a 24-hour day and when it is a long period of time. It's very confusing. How do I know what to interpret day as? Yeah. And so basically, people who do that, they are manipulating meaning with motive because you're trying to fit in evolution or fit in whatever you want to believe instead of trying to understand what God really says and means. Okay, so for us, uh, what God says is literal, created in six 24-hour days, and then rested uh, on the Sabbath, which is a 24-hour day. And that is where he told his people, do the same like me. Work on six days. Cannot be six geologic ages. People don't live that long. Six 24-hour days. And then have the Sabbath day to honor God. Okay, so here's a, a dig at this concept. Okay, if, uh, if man will evolve some more, you know, because you say evolution, so man should probably not be, be, be the end already. Human evolution in future, this one, I set downwards to look directly into your phone. Small brain, because thinking will be done by Google now. Yeah, we have a Google Assistant and uh, AI. Special long thumbs to facilitate scrolling on Android. You know, we're so much on the phone. Use our thumb to scroll. And small legs because there's no need to go anywhere. Now everything you can do online. <laughs> okay. So that's human evolution in future. Okay. So as you can see, men will probably not evolve into another life form. Okay. So to continue, right? Bible skeptics. Uh, about now we move on to the flood. Eh? Bible skeptics say there is no geological, uh, sorry, geographical or archaeological evidence whatsoever for a worldwide flood. Uh, unfortunately, because they're skeptics, they do not 
they do not actually examine the evidence. They just make a statement. So in that sense, we see uh, it's very contradictory because they are not being scientific at all. Why? Because they didn't bother to, to, to uh, put into practice the science principles of investigation. Yeah. So they don't investigate. They just make a plain statement, uh, no evidence. So that is simply untrue. The evidence for a worldwide flood is overwhelming. If there were a catastrophic worldwide flood where much or most of the water came from below, you would expect to find layers of sedimentary rock laid down quickly by water containing billions of fossils. And that's exactly what we find today. Billions of plants and animal fossils laid down in sedimentary layers all over the globe. They were drowned and buried so quickly, they couldn't even be eaten by scavengers. Okay, so these are the layers with the fossils buried in them. So we have the reality of catastrophism in Mount St. Helens points backward for us. Something happening in our own lifetime that we can observe and understand the massive cataclysm of the flood of Noah's time. This was Mount St. Helens one day before it erupted. And so we have a record of Mount St. Helens, what happened. Then we also have a story of the flood and it's recorded in Genesis chapters 6 to 8. So both we have records. One is within our lifetime, that is Mount St. Helens. The other one, not within our lifetime, but we compare the records and the results. What follows after? Okay, so we have a flood of evidence. There is much historical and scientific evidence for a global flood. The global flood is the biblical event where the world was completely submersed by a massive flood that covered the whole land of the entire planet. First of all, we find that there are actually stories from around the world and they verify Noah's flood. Did you know that stories about a worldwide flood are found in historic records all over the world? There are hundreds of stories and legends about a worldwide flood. According to Dr. Duane Gish in his popular book, Dinosaurs by Design, there are more than 270 such stories, most of which share a common theme and similar characters. And why do diverse cultures share such a strikingly similar story? Well, these numerous flood stories with such similarities surely come from the flood of Noah's day. You see, the fact that at least 270 cultures or stories, actually independently and across the world, they can come up with a story about a global flood, means there must be some truth, right? Like people say, there's no smoke without fire. Right, So the fact that you have so many stories and they, they didn't conspire, they didn't pack up, no conspiracy theory, they didn't conspire because they are spread out across the world. Yeah? And so the fact that so many cultures have the story must point to the fact that there must have been such a truth. It's historical truth. So the worldwide catastrophic flood recorded in the book of Genesis was a real event that affected real people. And these people carried the knowledge of this event with them when they spread to the ends of the earth. And you may recall from the Bible that uh, the people separated from the Tower of Babel across the different nations of the earth. Yeah, so they carried the story of the flood with them. The Bible reports the 
earth covering cataclysm of Noah's day as an obvious fact of history. Uh, people willingly are ignorant that the world that then, sorry, don't have the that, the world then was being overflowed with water, perished. Second Peter 3 verses 5 and 6 in the King James Version. So people were intentionally ignorant. This flood left many evidences from the fact that over 70% of the rocks on continents were laid down by water and contain sedimentary layers filled with fossils to the widespread flood legends. These evidences and more provide compelling support for this historical event. Eight people, that's Noah's family, survived the flood, and we can expect there to be historical evidence of a worldwide flood from these witnesses. So the eight people, some of them at least, would have talked about it and passed on the story. If you think about it, the evidence would be historical records in the nations of the world that formed from nowhere and its surviving family members. That's where Genesis 10, the table of nations, comes in. Wherever they spread across the earth, many of them would have remembered and talked about the story. And that's what we have in the chart below. So in this chart here, uh, these authors, John D. Morris and Tim LaHaye, gathered in their book, The Ark on Araret, a list of some of the many accounts of the flood. So that's the flood music there. The following is the impressive list of over 212 accounts. Okay, so here is just a list of some, a list of some, not all. And you have the Middle East and Africa, you have the Pacific Islands, yes, and uh, only 48 on this list. Okay, but there are 212 accounts. So that speaks for itself that it must have been true. Otherwise, why do so many, uh, why do so many uh, peoples have the story, although they are varied, okay? Stories of the flood, distorted though they may be, exist in practically all nations from ancient Babylon onward. This evidence must not be lightly dismissed. It's just that we are talking about uh, witnesses in a court of law, right? You have so many witness accounts of flood, even though they might not have seen the flood, but they did not come together. There was no aeroplane or for them to connect in travel and there was no internet to connect them other ways. So they could not possibly have conspired. If there was never a worldwide flood, then why are there so many independent stories across the world? Our stories of the flood may be distorted, no? vis-a-vis -vis the Bible account. So when you compare according to the Bible account, they are distorted because they are peoples who forgot or they were ignorant of God and his judgment as time went on. Yeah, the stories that passed down, we know uh, when people pass messages, they do distort messages. So they distorted the flood and they came up with all kinds of uh, versions and made up their own local versions to explain what happened. But the, the concept of the flood remains consistent. So you have a picture here of uh, Emperor Yu's great flood. And so that shows China also had a great flood story uh, somewhere about 4,000 years ago. And then you have, uh, you have a comparison of all these Places, okay, you have comparison of these places. I will not go through, that would take too much time. You can go through on your own time and leisure when you receive the slides or when you check up with YouTube to review this, okay? You can pause on YouTube to study this chart if you like. Uh, one side is the Bible references and then the various stories from the, the various places, how they 
give a full representation of biblical idea versus a partial representation of the biblical idea. Okay, the, the, uh, the green, yellowish green versus the orange triangle. Okay, so we have another table where you have the universal reach of the flood, biblical statements and evidence, yeah, uh, which again, very detailed, but I will not go through. And you have the references, the mention of them with the references here, if they are found in the Bible, those details. But a flood of a universal scale like this would have made unimaginably incredible changes to the face of the earth. Just looking at Mount St. Helens alone, one little mountain, we have seen that it affected the landscape in that area. So imagine if it has such uh, massive results, such as producing canyons and new river systems and, and uh, sedimentary layers and so on there, then a flood of a whole planet Earth would have caused really, really unimaginable changes, which we cannot talk about because we have never experienced that, okay, as compared to Mount St. Helens, which we can study. So what we do know from what is left behind uh, of the flood is this uh, global flood evidence. And if there was a global flood, what evidence would we expect to find that has been left for us? First of all, we will find erosion of solid rock and soils over vast continents. If you recall, uh, they, they said that the, the water flowing, fast flowing water has the power to punch through rock and metal. And imagine this is a planet of a global flood. So imagine how much water there would be, yeah? For the kind of damage that we see on planet Earth, there must be a massive amount of water plus the speed of the flow, like, like a flash flood, okay? to cause destruction at the global level. So you have erosion of solid rock and soils over vast continents. And then you have the sedimentary pulverized fragments of rock. So the rocks are smashed, many of them to bits. And oceanic materials spread over enormous areas and then redeposited somewhere else because of the flow of the flood. Then you have vast sedimentary runoffs from when the waters receded. So the waters go down and they would have carried sediment as well and then reform the dry land. Then you have massive redepositing of materials spanning great distances away, laying sediment, bending vast layers as laid down while still wet. Okay, so they are like layers of a, you know, a multi-layered cake, huh? leaving huge layers without any evidence of plant, insect, or living things. But at the same time, there would be layers as massive burial grounds, rich in dead plants and animal fossils. Right, So it makes sense that there is actually a massive burial ground because of the flood depositing a lot of the dead animal remains at the same time. Rather than evolution, the animals don't all come to die together and become fossil together. It doesn't make sense, right? So science and common sense must be together. Then we have fossils and remains even on the highest mountain peaks at every level, flat land as well as mountain peaks, you have fossils, yeah. So this evidence is exactly what we find literally everywhere on the planet. And here we have a picture of the largest, one of the largest deposits of dinosaur and mammoth remains in Russia. So to say that uh, evolution takes place where all these animals come to die together, doesn't make sense. Okay, so we have sediments and sedimentary rocks. They have layers of their sedimentary layers all over the globe. And they're laid down by weight the heaviest material at the bottom and then the lightest at the top. 
and perfectly graduated by weight in between. Just like when you get a bottle, like you conduct your own experiment, get a bottle of different sorts of soils and stuff and you shake, 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 and then you will see the heaviest one at the bottom with the lightest up at the top. Exactly what you would expect from a worldwide flood when you see our sedimentary layers. Okay, so prove that they were laid down by water over a short time, not millions of years. Heaviest by weights at the bottom, lightest at the top. Okay, so now we look at how fossils form. When an organism, whether a plant or animal dies, it typically gets buried. And usually this takes time, but it can happen faster. For those cases where living things, they fall into pits or similar structures, and as more layers of sediment are added, pressure increases on top of them, causing the sediments to compact into rock. So the pressing down. As the body decays, minerals seep into it and they fill the spaces where gases or fluids in the body used to be. This is known as permineralization. Alternately, the minerals that are in it chemically break down and are reformed or replaced. So eventually, most or all of what is left is a rock-like copy of the body. So this is an example of the impression, okay, the fossil. Okay, so we find here evidence for a global flood are literally everywhere around the planet. Fossils found on top of the highest mountains, polystrate tree stumps pierced defiantly through so-called millions of years of rock layers. We will look at some pictures later. Coal bed graveyards, fossil forests, enormous sedimentary layers, miles thick cover the continents. Massive erosion spread over thousands of miles. Rock layers as evidence of the sorting of materials by flood waters. Mountains made of bent rocks and a planet surface that is more than 70% covered by water, which is deeper than six miles in places. And here you have a fossil graveyard at Carnegie Museum, right? Look at all the fossils together. Cannot be evolution that all these, all these bones become fossils because animals come together. Oops, sorry. Okay, so you have fossils on highest mountain tops. You have the geological strata contain marine fossils as critical evidence that the ocean once covered the continents. Sorry. Continue. Sorry. Uh, hold on. Uh. Something wrong. Where my screen sharing is paused. Just hold on while I sort out this. <laughs> Okay, hold on for a while. I have to stop screen share and do it back again. Okay, so we have the geological stru strata contain marine fossils. Okay, marine means animals from the sea as critical evidence that the ocean once covered the continents, even the highest continental areas. Extremely widespread strata blankets argue for an intercontinental or global flood. Okay, so the strata, strata blankets actually uh, start from one continent and continue across the ocean to another continent. That's what it means. For example, most of the rock layers in the Grand Canyon walls, more than a mile above sea level, contain marine fossils and fossilized shellfish and are even found in the Himalayas. So Grand Canyon, all the way to the Himalayas. 
if we had a global flood, we would expect to find fossils even on the tops of the highest mountains. And again, this is what we find, because you remember the flood covered the top of the mountains. Okay, then we have fish fossils above 10,000 feet. Right, fish fossils above 10,000 feet. Millions of fish died in the turbulent waters during the flood and are fossilized today for us to see. This is a fish fossil that not only contains a fossilized fish, but also fish feces near its mouth. Can you see this fossil, this picture, the fish? And it is not very clear, but it has got feces near the mouth. So you think about it, common sense tells you why would there be feces near the mouth if it is died? It should have rotted away, right? Normal, normal kind of situation that we are familiar with, the feces would have rotted away. But when a fish poops in the water, the feces disintegrates in just 20 to 30 seconds. So for the fish to have been covered and fossilized together, it would have had to have been a sudden and catastrophic event, correct? Otherwise, the, the feces should have dispersed. So the fact that the species is near the mouth shows that in that, in that very short moment of seconds, the fish and the, and the feces were actually covered, buried, okay, and then fossilized from there. So even more interesting is that the fish and poop fossil was found near the top of Mount Albert in Colorado, the highest mountain in Colorado. So it's found on the mountain top, not in the sea. How did those fish get buried quickly up that high if there had been no worldwide flood covering the mountains? Why can fish fossils be found on or near the top of every mountain worldwide? Okay, all the mountains. And a simple commonsensical answer is because the flood covered the whole earth. So fascinating results we find today. Okay, then uh, let me see. Evidence of the flood is everywhere. Continue. There are sea fossils on the highest mountains of every continent. Even the top one third of Mount Everest is all loaded with sea fossils. And we know Mount Everest is the highest mountain. In addition, the remains of whales have been found in the deserts of nearly every continent. Deserts, huh? So here we have this picture where it shows scientists unearthing a major whale fossil hoard in Chile. Scientists in November 2011 at that time we were in the process of excavating a desert fossil bed in Chile containing dozens of whole skeletons of ancient whales dating back, you see, they call it 7 million years. Yeah. So we find that, uh, we find that the, the, the people continue finding fossils that contradict evolution, but they will still quote the ages and terms in terms of like, the geologic ages of millions of years. And some, one of the researchers said 15 whales were found in 15 days, far exceeding expectations. You see, it's incredible that you can find so many together. They would have been buried quickly together, yeah? Rather than they all 15 of them come one at a time to die in the same, in a, in a, in a desert, yeah? Quite ridiculous if you think about it, but well, we really have to use some common sense. Okay, more evidence. You have bones of sharks have been found in Kansas and other plains states, right? Far away from the sea. The earth was underwater, obviously. So this prehistoric shark fossil is exhibited at the University of Kansas Natural History Museum and many shark fossils were found in Kansas, far away from the sea. The flood is also what wiped out the dinosaurs, and even today, 
scientists are still guessing what, have, what killed them. That is how dinosaur fossils have been found on top of the mountains of Antarctica. But we know what wiped them out. It was the flood of Noah's day. Over a ton of dinosaur remains lie within the soil of the continent. Okay, so the dinosaurs in Noah's Ark, after the flood, they couldn't survive the change in the planet. So they died for the, the two of dinosaurs that went inside the Ark. Okay, so while the oceans existed before the flood, after the flood, the oceans became much larger, yeah, because of the flood waters and much of the ocean water that exists today is a result of the great flood. There are over 326 million trillion gallons of water on earth and not a drop on the moon. Seven billion people and 326 billion trillion gallons of water on earth and nothing like that on any other planet. And the evolutionist, evolutionist says this is just coincidence and some luck of random chance. Yeah, but we know that this exactly fits the flood of the Bible. Okay, so just now you may remember I mentioned the polystrate fossil. A polystrate fossil is a fossil of a single organism, for example, a tree trunk, okay? And that extends through more than one geological stratum, so-called the evolution across uh, many millions of years, right? If it's slowly, slowly laying, laying down the layers over millions of years. This term is typically applied to fossil forests of upright fossil tree trunks. They are standing up and stumps that have been found worldwide. They are found in the Eastern United States, Eastern Canada, England, France, Germany, Australia, typically associated with coal-bearing strata. So they, you will find coal with them, not surprisingly, because we get a lot of coal from them. Yeah, and they, you can see they straddle layers According to uniformitarian principles, if you remember, the time needed for all these sediments to accumulate is many thousands of years, slowly build up. Yeah, But the evidence indicates that the shale was deposited quickly over the trees. Remember Mount St. Helens? Right? The trees were all standing up right after they floated on the, on the lake. Yeah? Then they sank down because the roots the part absorbed water and was heavier. So these evidence of the polystrate fossil of trees, they were still standing upright. Many of these trees were buried at the same time when all the rock layers were yet still liquid, all the sediment layers, rock layers, they were still wet. And polystrate fossils are found all around the world once again, and are yet additional evidence for a global flood. So you have see this picture this um, here, and here's a man standing on uh, one of them. Okay, as I said, it's a fossil of a single organism, such as a tree trunk, and it extends through more than one geological stratum. So you have the tree here, the polystrate tree. Yeah, and then there are very nicely these arrows to show us different strata. So if each layer represents many millions of years, yeah, you can see four, four layers. Each layer is many millions of years. How were the trees able to stand upright and not rot away while they were slowly being buried over millions of years? Yeah, over millions of years, they would have rotted away and not just straddle so many layers. Rapid strata formation, once again, you can see, right, the, they are in different layers. And this is a hammer somebody left there to show us the scale, right? So deposited at the same time, the layers, 
in a very short while rather than millions of years. Okay, you have more pictures here. Right, so all the evidence points to a rapid burial of the tree in mudslides and molten rock layers over a very short period of time. And it actually destroys the idea that rock layers represent many millions of years of time. So you can see a lot of pictures of all these, yeah, from different places. Uh, vertical fossil trees are called polystrate. And poly means many, straight means strata or layers. So there are many layers, right? And this, uh, so we can ask questions about did they grow where they are found? Did they, they are found here, did they grow here? Okay, and other questions, uh, or did the trees grow somewhere else? Or they were they ripped up from somewhere, carried along and then rapidly buried? Oh in vertical position by a catastrophic deluge. And here this picture shows not all fossil trees are vertical. Yeah, uh, you have some inclined at about 150 to surrounding strata and apparently upside down. Okay, so you can... Uh, there can be no doubt that fossil trees up to one meter thick without roots did not grow where they are buried. Yeah, so they were actually transported there because uh, the, the flood ripped them up and deposited them somewhere else in vertical pos position and then quickly buried them with mud and sand. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the details. We have a lot of other slides to go through. So you want to see more of these pictures, all right? You can go to this, uh, this website for the evidence from polystrate fossils. They have quite a number of pictures. So the conclusion is fossil trees, leaves are buried vertically in multiple layers. And provably they are not rare. None of these Fossils provide any help to evolution. Yeah, they don't support the idea of evolution. There are many theories and opinions that contradict biblical creation and Noah's flood, but the facts do not contradict the Bible. Okay, so we have coal. Evolutionists say coal is uh, 300 million years old. Yeah, coal is 300 million years old and radiocarbon dating dates it at thousands of years old. See the difference? Yeah, they claim millions of years, but the radiocarbon dating is only thousands of years. Evolutionary theory claims they take, coal takes millions of years to form, but laboratory and field research has demonstrated that coal is formed rapidly and in big quantities. And these are unsullied by other material. So the conclusion is actual research shows a young age to the earth that contains such qualified materials. Okay, so planet earth uh, from the coal that we get is actually thousands of years and not millions of years. In fact, in fact, now people can manufacture synthetic coal. Yeah, they can reproduce coal from something called fermentation residue. And you can see they have all these machines to produce coal. Yeah, so it shows us that coal can be made and quite quickly because who will go into business to make coal over th thousands of years or hundreds of years, right? It has to be made quickly. Yes. So it doesn't have to take millions or even thousands of years. And so therefore, once again, you can see that uh, all the evidence when we have scientific research now, they're actually pointing towards a young earth and a flood, a global flood. Oops, sorry. 
Here is a fossil forest, yeah, and the world has many petrified forests found on nearly every continent on Earth. I'm not going to go through the details. The evidence indicates, right at the bottom, the evidence indicates it could be they were laid down rapidly by water simultaneously. We're talking about the uh, stone desert as well as the painted desert of Arizona. Okay, so you have the fossil forests. Once again, you can see they're standing upright. Yeah, of course, there may be some that are uh, flat down. Okay, so more interesting things we have, oh, sorry, where we find that uh, evidence for a worldwide flood. This is a picture shows a fossil of fish swallowing fish. Once again, it must have been very fast, okay? Because a fish would not stay there to die and then uh, have, a dip, have an, another fish in its mouth when it dies, yeah? So the position of the two fish together would show that they were buried very quickly so that neither could escape and they are in this position, yeah? To preserve this, the bury, rapid burial, preserve this fish in the act of swallowing another fish. And thousands of such fossils have been found. Okay, it's not just one incidental, but it's thousands, right? So fossils of fish swallowing another fish and mass graves mean that the animals died at the same time. Otherwise, one would have escaped. The small one would have escaped or the big one would have finished swallowing and moved on. Yeah, and they were covered over very quickly by sediment be sorry, before they could decay, not because they could decay. This is very strong support once again for the global flood. So evidence of sudden death, and this isn't the only one. There are thousands of such finds all over the world, which is exactly what you would expect to find if there really was a sudden worldwide flood. Death post mystery is another very interesting one. Look at the position of the, of the fossils, the dinosaurs that died and became fossilized. Dinosaur and bird fossils are frequently found in a characteristic posture, consisting of the head thrown back and the tail extended and mouth wide open. Of course, for us human beings, that's shock. Yeah, the cause of this posture, sometimes called a death pose, has been a matter of scientific debate. Traditional explanations ranged from strong ligaments in the animal's neck desiccating and contracting to draw the body into the pose, to water currents randomly arranging the remains in the position. So scientists try to explain this with how the chemicals in the body cause this distortion and all that sort of stuff, but they're still, they're still missing the point. Why, why it's like that is because of the flood and not just the chemicals alone. And they were drowned in the global flood. Death post mystery. They were drowned in the global flood. The head is drawn back with mouth wide open, trying to breathe. Note the articulated skeleton. Articulated means they were rapidly buried and fossilized. Yeah, the position shows probably that they were shocked or trying to breathe. So the evidence that a global flood has occurred in the past is actually overwhelming. Right, Every area of evidence supports the probability of a worldwide flood as described in the Bible. Examples of evidence created by massive flood waters include the fossils, polystrate trees, bent rock layers, coal formation, and many others. Again, we cannot go back and confirm the Bible's account. Yeah, So we have all this evidence, but because we cannot go back and observe the actual event. 
right? That, that is what science demands, always talking about observing the actual event. So the Bible, we cannot confirm because we can't go back, yeah? But neither can naturalism, okay? Naturalism, part of uh, evolution. However, we can certainly review the data and conclude that the plausibility of a global flood abounds. So we want to be fair, we say the possibility and the likelihood is very high, but because nobody was there to observe, we cannot say 100% yes. But you can see the evidence for yourself, right, is very convincing. Okay, so understand this concept of naturalism. Evolution falls under the larger umbrella of naturalism. Naturalism is a worldview that proposes everything exists without supernatural or intelligent influence. That means no God or no smart person came to interfere with the natural process. Therefore, from the perspective of naturalism by definition, everything that happened in the universe happened only by and because of a strict natural mechanism called spontaneous chance. Just happened. No reason. Or another way to state it is, Everything exists for no reason. It's just a cosmic accident. Call it by luck or of unimaginable odds, chance and so on, coincidence and so on. Okay, so we see the worldview of naturalism views all the phenomena we discover all around the world as random, unrelated and isolated occurrences. Okay, so people look at all the different things happening in the world and they just explain here, explain there, explain this, but no connection. Seen in isolation, the occurrences make no sense. As you can see here, I've got all these pictures. They represent that each, like for example, sedimentary layers, the scientists explain this, 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 death post fossils, scientists explain this, 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 coal formation, the scientists explain this, this, this but they have no connection, okay? So seen in isolation that they are just very random, all these things make no sense. However, however, this is something that I want to make a point. Scientists may offer all kinds of opinions and explanations for the various geologic mysteries and phenomena in the natural world. They may even try to offer possibilities for why fossils are formed, death posts of animals, you know, all the chemical, what happened in their bodies, and they provide what they think is a scientific cause. But there is something lacking in their theories and explanations, connectivity, okay? Is there something that connects all these things together so that they actually make a coherent sense together. There's something that you see scientists fail to give us. It's all just random, 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 but don't make sense. So not just the scientific why, or this chemical that happened, or how the method, or this chemical did this thing and that thing and chemicals, but the what led to the occurrences and what brings them together in one coherent cause. See, so just now, all the funny, funny things earlier on, they happen randomly, but now when we put them together, where they make sense, they come together to show us a picture. Okay, so what contrasts to naturalism is the significant fact that a common strand connects all these phenomena together, like the radiating spokes of a wheel. They come like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle to unveil the story of the global flood. You see, they all connect together to this center spoke. Yeah, the, radi uh, the radiating spokes, they all connect together to a center that makes everything come together as one whole, like a jigsaw puzzle. The flood caused the curious phenomena of sediment layers, death, post fossilization, soft tissue, which we are going to look at after today, after the session, and more, a lot more. 
It is the single unifying factor that confirms history as recorded accurately in the Bible. For God is the one and only living witness of the flood that caused these things. And God provides a record of it in the Bible. Okay, so everything all comes together to make one coherent picture. So what can we, what can we conclude or say? God created the world to efficiently recycle organic material. When something dies, scavengers, fungi like mushrooms and or bacteria normally consume it. This process of decomposition leaves nothing behind to fossilize. However, massive catastrophes like Noah's flood would produce the conditions necessary to quickly bury and protect creatures so that they can fossilize. It appears that God wanted to leave a flood of evidence of his past judgment of mankind's sin. So you see, there is actually a story behind them that brings everything together. It is the wise who will take heed of God's messages to all of mankind. So we actually have a flood of evidence and we will continue it in the next session. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love. Once again, God, that you are a good God who not only created, but you give us enough to live the life that you want us to live according to your ways and for the mysteries of earth that have to do with flood and which connect to your judgment on mankind. Lord, we thank you that you have given us enough evidence and enough information to know how we should therefore relate to you and examine our lives and the direction that we go. And so we pray, Father, Lord, that the evidence will convict us and you, your spirit, will guide us and lead us to seek your ways and go deeper into your truth and live according to what you desire for us. We give you thanks and praise for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.